Our topic is UVATs, various aspects of UVATs, including surgical and medical management. So, we are directly going to the topic. Dr. Shamin Solomon, our Associate Professor, Government Medical College, Calicut, will be talking on the topic of advances in investigative techniques in UVATs. Over to Shamin. Good afternoon. So, what is new in UVATs? There are lots of investigations that have made the life of the ophthalmologist easier. And now we hear the term multimodal imaging, which is uh, we collect uh, images from various modalities, various machines, and which help us to uh, understand the disease as well as monitor response and treatment. So, we have color fundus photography, multicolor imaging, fundus autofluorescence, fundus fluorescein angiography, indocyanin green angiography, and the non-invasive optical coherence tomography and OCT angiography. So, in color fundus photography, we have been ha we have these machines uh, since long. The conventional cameras give us 50 to 55 degree view of the retina, while the wide field images uh, cover 60 to 100 degrees of retina. The newer ultra wide field give us up to 82 percent of the retina we can visualize with a single click. And these machines are good because uh, it can even do uh, we give us these images in a non midriatic pupil that is especially if there are cyanicae and the pupil is not dilating in posterior uveitis they are helpful and it also helps in document of documentation of the disease at presentation and to explain the disease to the patient they can see for themselves what is happening in their eye and their response to the treatment so next is multicolor imaging we which uses confocal scanning technology you, it, is, it uses three lasers instead of single white light and the three layers give us information from the different layers of the retina. The blue laser gives us information from the vitreo macular interface and the inner retinal layers, the green from the middle retinal layers and the red from the outer retina and choroid. So the uh, benefit is that it is it gives us higher contrast and more detailed images. It is less affected by media opacities and again in non midriatic Then we have fundus fluorescein angiography which is uh, helpful. Uh, in most cases of uh, uveitis we have early hypofluorescence to late hyperfluorescence. And fu fundus fluorescein angiography now helps us especially in cases of occlusive vasculitis where you need to look at the um, peripheral red, uh, for capillary non-perfusion areas and of course macular ischemia. CNP areas it is helpful to delineate and targeted photocoagulation can be carried out. If there is disc leakage you can you know that the disc optic nerve head is also inflamed and NVD, NVE all this can be well delineated with the FFA. Then coming to indocyanin green angiography it has helped us to uh, divide the uveitic entities into primary inflammatory choreocapillaropathy and secondary inflammatory choreocapillaropathy as well as stromal inflammatory vasculopathy. And then we have fundus autofluorescence which is coming up in a big way there are lots of studies which uh, help us uh, explain the pathophysiology of the uveitic entities. So basically this is a mapping of the lipofusion in the retina again uses confocal SLO technology and uh, it is a measure of the RPE photoreceptor status. Then we have optical coherence tomography and also angiography. It is a non-invasive objective tool for documentation and follow-up response to treatment. You can assess the complications especially with the OCT, the macular edema, macular atrophy, the epiretinal membrane and CNVM. And there are also studies which uh, grade intraocular inflammation in the anterior segment with the SSOCT. Then you have uh, OCT angiography which helps us to look into detail of pathophysiologic mechanism of various UVIT entities and monitor response to treatment. It is also very sensitive to diagnose uh, type 1 and type 2 CNVM. Then if the lesions are retinal and in the posterior pole we can always start off with an OCT and in the periphery you can use ultra wide field imaging and some machines also have ultra wide field OCT with them. Associated vascular pathology is present, go for an FFA. On follow-up, OCT angiography or FFA will help you. Choroidal lesions, the first would be the fundus autofluorescence, which will help you to differentiate between the entities and also in treatment and follow-up. Then to confirm the condition, you can do an ICG angiography. So, uh, coming to uh, retinitis uh, lesions, first we have the commonest of them all that is the toxoplasmosis. Im uh, tox imaging can help in monitoring the response to treatment and help you to decide when to stop treatment, especially when they are on uh, an, uh, anti toxoplasmic drugs and steroids, you need to know when to exactly stop treatment. So, this is a very objective method. 
uh, on the OCT in the acute stage, you can have vitreous cells, posterior hyaloid thickening, and deposits on the retinal surface with mirror, mirror image deposits on the hyaline. There is full thickness retinal involvement. The green that is the that is a full thickness retinal involvement there. And in contrast to viral retinitis, you can see that the there is a focal choroidal thickening. You, the blue oval is the focal choroidal thickening below the retinitis patch. So on resolution, first you get a resolution of the vitreitis and then the retinal edema and the choroidal thickening goes down. Then on the OCT angiography, you can detect CNVM if it develops in the chronic stage. Then we have the viral retinitis. In the viral retinitis, you have in uh, again necrotizing full thickness retinitis. But in this, the um, difference is that the sparing of the RPE and choroid in, in uh, contrast to toxo. And CMV retinitis, the vitreitis will be less. The, uh, there are two patterns that have been described, the full thickness pattern and cavernous pattern on OCT. These cavernous areas may later go in for uh, retinal thinning, breaks and regmatogenous detachment. Then coming to FAF in viral retinitis, the active lesions at the arrow, they show the uh, active edge which is hyperfluorescent in contrast to the uh, ischemic necrotic area and this is a indicator of progression of the disease. If this moves posteriorly, you know that the patient is not responding to your treatment. It, it helps in defining the disease process and to monitor response to treatment. So this is another uh, case where an 8 year old presented with a loss of vision for one week. The only positive history she had was that of parotid enlargement with fever two weeks prior to this lesion, to the issue. So on examination her vision was uh, CFCF with sluggish pupil bilaterally and with the classical presentation we diagnosed uh, progressive outer retinal necrosis. In that you have outer retinal edema and thickening which later involves the full thickness retina and goes in for retinal atrophy soon. So this was a 40 year old male who complains of blurring of vision with history of fever without rash 3 weeks prior and the best corrected equity was 5 by 60. He was uh, evaluated elsewhere, IgG toxo came positive, IgG CMB came positive. Now what do we do? So here you can see that there are multiple retinitis lesions, there is a associated vasculitis. So in uh, also the patient being from an uh, area endemic for typhus, we went in for the wheel felix test and it was positive. The patient was started on doxycycline and steroids and his vision improved to 6-12 within 10 days. So this is the initial OCT, you can see the full thickness retinitis lesion, the hyporeflective space suggestive of macular edema and the inflammatory cells within the retina. So with the uh, doxycycline and steroids, the patient improved very well. So uh, OCT angiography in uh, recursial retinitis, you can, uh, it is helpful for visual prognosis because there will be capillary dropout areas on the superficial capillary plexus and the deep plexus. Enlargement of the FAZ if it is seen, it is a definite indicator that the patient's vision is not going to return to normal. And there may be flow void areas or it may even be projection artifacts on the uh, choriocapillary slab, but this usually recovers. Then coming to dengue, Three types of involvement have been described on the OCT as diffuse retinal thickening, cystoid macular edema and thickening and increased reflectivity in the subfoveal outer retinal layer suggestive of foveolitis. The uh, Swepsos OCT, uh, newer things have been defined like hyperreflectivity of the outer nuclear layer, the conical foveal elevation, intraretinal cystoid spaces, outer retinal thickening and disruption. The OCT angiography again shows uh, perifoveal flow deficits more in the deep capillary plexus more than the superficial which persists in spite of steroid therapy. And uh, coming to a non-infectious retinitis, the, the Berchia's disease, the FFA can give you the classical fern leaf pattern of leakage with capillary non-perfusion areas. And uh, on OCT you have focal inner retinal thickening. So this is different from the other viral retinitis where you have focal inner retinal thickening and uh, cystoid macular edema may be associated and the long term you can have an epiretinal membrane or even rare cases macular atrophy. So OCT angio again shows, uh, sorry, uh, coming to the multiple evanescent white dot syndrome. So in the white, uh, white dot syndromes, the FAF will give you a clue to what is happening. So in uh, mutes we have the hyper autofluorescent lesions here. And on ICG, you have hypocyanosin spots which persist into the late phase. OCT shows disruption of the ellipsoid zone with inter and the intergenitation complex with an intact RP. Then in AP and PP, you have the larger placoid lesions here. 
and on OCT angiography you have flow deficit on the choreocapillary these are multiple flow deficit areas here on the choreocapillary slab the ICGA will show you placoid hypofluorescent lesions in the active stage on the OCT you have outer retinal hyperreflectivity with disruption and RPE hyperreflectance and increase in the choroidal thickness in the inactive stage, there is disappearance of the hyperreflectivity uh, and there may be restoration, partial restoration or atrophy of the outer retinal layers with normalization of the choroidal thickness. <laughs> On uh, um, FAF, you have hypoautofluorescence corresponding to the outer retinal hyperreflectivity. Uh, hyper and the inactive stage, you have progressive increase in the hyperautofluorescence. So, you have a mixed pattern here. In multifocal choroiditis spectrum, the FAF will give you hypoautofluorescent uh, lesions with a hyperfluorescent halo. On ICG angiography, you can confirm it with hyposinescent lesions which persist and expand into the late phase. On OCT, you have hyperreflective material breaking through the RPE with outer retinal disruption. And in coming to serpiginous and serpiginous like choroiditis, in the active stage, you have outer retinal hyperreflectivity, loss of the ellipsoid zone and increase in choroidal thickness. In the heel stage, there is thinning and atrophy of the outer retina, RP and choroid. And in this, you have hyperfluorescent lesions in the active stage. Then a thin rim of hypofluorescence, hypoautofluorescence starts surrounding the lesion. Then it comes to a mixed pattern, predominantly hypofluorescent. And this comes to uniform hypoautofluorescence when the lesion becomes inactive. Then OCT angiography in serpiginous or serpiginous like choroiditis, there is choreocapillaris flow disruption uh, which precedes the involvement of the outer retinal layers and RPE. And the choreocapillary slab lesions in the active stage are larger than what is seen on the fundus autofluorescence. Lesions, it is important to look at this because if the lesions are not associated with FAF abnormalities, uh, it is an early sensitive sign of disease activity and if you intervene at this stage, you can prevent more damage. Then coming to choroidal stromal inflammation in tuberculosis, the tuberculous granulomas are usually solitary, large and they have more fluid accumulation as compared to other stromal involvement. Then you have the contact sign where the RPE, choreocapillaries and the overlying neurosensory retina show inflammatory changes. Then coming to sarcoidosis, you have multiple homogeneous hyperreflective lesions with well-defined margins and less fluid that compared to tuberculosis. In the Okoyanagi Harada disease, we on the FFA you have the starry sky pattern with late pooling and the ICG angiography you have hyposinescent lesions uh, suggestive of choroidal granulomas and on the OCT angio you have, must have multiple flow void areas on the choreocapillary slab. On the OCT multiple uh, features have been described that is first of all the increase in choroidal thickness and the RP undulations. These are seen in majority of the eyes and if you see this, this is, uh, this is associated with more recurrence and worse vision. Compartmentalization of fluid in the subretinal space and in the intraretinal space is characteristic and the basilary layer detachment that is fluid accumulation within the photoreceptor layer is, character, is a feature. Then you have membranous structures which are shed photoreceptor outer segments and subretinal uh, hyperreflective dots which uh, result from high photoreceptor damage. So that is uh, in a nutshell about the newer things. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Shamin for the uh, beautiful explanation of newer advanced investigative modalities. Over to Dr. Babida, she will be talking on uh, thinking beyond topical steroids in UVATs. Good afternoon. There are multiple treatment options other than topical medication for UVATs. This include periocular injections, systemic treatment, immune modulatory agents, newer options and vitrectomy. The periocular injections include subconjunctural injection, subtinal injection, intravitreal, supracoroidal space injections, and transtinal retrobulbar injections. Indications of periocular injections include if a patient is non compliant to topical medication or partially responding to topical medication, or there occurs a breakthrough inflammation during topical medication, or as considered as an alternative to immune modulatory agents. Infectious uveitis and associated necrosis are contraindications for periocular injections. Triamcinol, acetinoid, dexamethasone and beta methasone can be <coughs> given as subconjunctural injection. 
Um, the other indication for subconjunctal injection is uveitic macular edema. So it is not working. This is how, this is how the in subconjunctal injection is given. The sub -sub subconjunctal injection is given. And then uh, the subconjunctal injection is technically very easy, but one disadvantage is chance of glaucoma is there, but it will respond to topical medication. If it is not responding to topical anti-glaucoma medication, we can easily remove the subconjunctal drug deposits. Single subconjunctal injection of liposomal transmembrane acetonide phosphate induces effective and sustained anti-inflammatory action in experimental UVHS. Triamcinone acetonide 40 mg per ml, 0.1 ml and methyl prednisolone can also be given as septinone injections. Other indications include intermediate uveitis, posterior uveitis and uveitic macular edema. The, these injections can be repeated 2 to 4 weekly. If there is no response after 4 injections, it is considered as failure of the treatment. And the um, uh, fit is less compared to intravitreal injections since the scleral penetration of these drugs are less. This uh, septal injections can be given as suprotemporal injection or infratemporal injection. The complications of suprotemporal approach include severe steroid induced glaucoma, upper eyelid ptosis, periorbital hemorrhage, and globe perforation. The infratemporal transseptal orbital fall approach has the complications like periorbital and retrobulbar hemorrhage, lower lid retracted ptosis, orbital fat prolapse with the orbital festoon formation, and orbital fat atrophy and skin discolorations. Triamcinone acetonide can also be given as suprachoroidal space inject injection with suprachoroidal space micro injectors. They are available with two mic micro needles of 900 and 1100 micrometer to accommodate patient variations. The micro needle is inserted into sclera 4 to 4.5 millimeter behind the limbus perpendicular to the surface and loss of resistance indicate the micro needle in the adequate position. Then inject drug slowly over 5 to 10 seconds. Then keep the in 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 needle 3 to 5 seconds for the drug to dispense. This is given in uveitic macular edema and the anterior segment complications are less for this approach since there is preferential distribution to posterior segment. But patient may have eye pain on the day of injection. Then various intravitreal uh, injections are available. They include triamcinolone, dexamethasone and fusinolone acetonide. Triamcinolone can be given as parsplana uh, uh, injection, 40 mg per 1 ml, 0.1 ml as parsplana injection with 30 gauge needle. And this injection can be repeated 3 monthly. The disadvantages include glaucoma, rheumatoid retinal detachment and endophthalmitis. This is how intravitreal injection is given. It is given uh, 3.5 to 4 millimeter behind the limbus. Then uh, triamcinone acetonide implants are also available. 0 0.4 into 0 0.21 millimeter titanium helical non biodegradable implants can be uh, in surgically inserted into the vitreous cavity. It contains 925 microgram triamcinone acetonide and uh, drug delivery lasts for about 2 years. This helical design increases the surface area of drug delivery and stabilizes the implant. This is the implant. In point trial, uh, the intravitreal triamcinone acetonide and intravitreal dexamethasone implants were uh, found to be superior to periocular triamcinone acetonide in treating uveitic macular edema with a modest increase in the risk of IOP elevation. And this risk did, uh, did not differ between these drugs. Dexamethasone pellets contain 700 microgram dexamethasone available. They are biodegradable and used in uh, posterior uveitis and intermediate uveitis can be retained in position for 3 to 6 months. But the complications like glaucoma and cataract is there. And the relative contraindications are aphakia, post vitrectomized style, absence of lens capsule. There is a uh, risk of anterior chamber migration of the pellet. Then fluosinolone acetonide implants containing 590 micro, microgram fluosinolone. It has to be surgically implanted into a vitreous cavity. This is effective for uh, 2.5 years. The complications include glaucoma in 75% of patients. Under uh, personal fatigue, patients can develop cataract. The chance of endophthalmitis, wound leak, hypotony, vitreous hemorrhage, and retinal attachment is there. But this can be re implanted or exchanged are possible. Then, fluosinolone acetonide injectable inserts containing 0.19 and 0.18 milligram 
Uh, Fruitslin is available. They are non-biodegradable and can be retained for three years. But the complication is like cataract and glaucoma is there. In mustile, they compare the uh, intravitreal fluosinolone and systemic steroid in posterior intermediate and pan uveitis for their visual recovery. But there is no difference in the visual outcome. Then transtenin retobulbar triamcinolone infusions are available. Then this given as 0.5 ml of 40 mg per ml triamcinolone indicated in vitreitis, steroid macular edema and retinal vasculitis. Cataract and glaucoma is less since there is a professional distribution to posterior segment only. But it cannot be done in sitting position in the under slit lamp. It has to be done in the so my, uh, operation theater. Then systemic steroids are indicated in bilateral uveitis, severe vision threatening uveitis, periocular steroids, when periocular steroids are contraindicated or lack of response to periocular steroids and associated systemic diseases. The oral prednisolone is given as 1 to 1.5 milligram per kilogram body weight, not more than 60 mg per day and has to be tapered very slowly. Or intravenous methyl prednisolone can be given, it also has to be tapered slowly. There are com multiple complications are there for systemic steroids. Then immune modulatory agents are considered if there is systemic steroids are contraindicated or patient develop drug, drug dependence or the complications are intolerable and uh, it will be dealt later. And the next is gene therapy and RNA interference is available for non-infectious uveitis management. Then vitrectomy is done in cases of uh, uveitis with a severe macular severe media opacities like cataract or inflammatory x-rays or hemorrhagic vitreous hemorrhage for improving the visual equity or per, uh, to visualize the posterior segment or in case of endophthalmitis and lens industry uveitis inflammatory for to control inflammation and in structural complications of uveitis like a retinal attachment, epiretinal membrane or chronic hypotony or to uh, um, for, for sustained intravitreal drug delivery deposits. The take home message is treatment of uveitis is a double edged sword. So be careful to avoid unnecessary complications and adverse effects. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Babita. Now, Dr. Prasanna will talk, uh, talk to us about tackling cataract and uveitis. Good evening. My topic is uh, tackling cataract in uveitic patients.
Okay, sorry for the delay. Uh, so, cataract is the most uh, frequent visual impairment complication of UVATs and it occurs in 64% of UVATs. Uh, uh, the cause of cataract is either the inherent inflammatory process, chronic steroid therapy or age-related change. The management of cataract is a challenge because of its less post, uh, predictable post-operative outcome. And uh, for the first step, determine the cause and uh, type of UVATs and treat the cause. Now, because of the novel surgical uh, techniques, pharmaceutical technology, perioperative control of information and biocompatible IOLs, prognosis has improved a lot. Uh, the evaluation of cataract uh, in UVATs uh, can be divided into uh, three stages, preoperative evaluation, intraoperative considerations and postoperative management. Visual potential assessment is before surgery is very important and patient should get a realistic in, uh, expectation uh, by giving proper counseling. Reason for surgery, visual rehabilitation versus posterior segment visualization, visualization. Uh, expected outcome, prolonged follow-up need, inherent need for perioperative uh, medication if additional procedures like pass plan with uh, if needed has to be given proper counseling. Preoperative evaluation, if the visual acuity is very poor, the uh, potential acuity meter or laser interferometry or focal cone ERG should be done. And B scan, ultrasound, uh, biomicroscopy, etc. should be done in appropriate cases. Visual prognosis uh, depends on the rate of infl inflammatory circulate and uh, which varies with uh, uveitic entities. Fuchs has best visual prognosis, JA has the worst. Uh, the uh, preoperative assessment, anterior segment should be examined for uh, posterior sinicae, peripheral anterior sinicae, inflammatory membrane, myotic pupil, band cartopathy, uh, shallow anterior chamber, etc. Need for a pupil expansion device if needed should be assessed preoperatively. Posterior segment also should be examined for obtinum, macula and retina. The indications for cataract surgery, according to Rogers, uh, Rogers and Poster, he described, uh, they describe four settings in which you do cataract surgery. One is visually significant cataract with good visual potential, posterior segment examination and posterior segment uh, surgery, uh, patients need posterior segment surgery, phaco antigenic uveitis and with other intraocular surgery like pass plana vitrectomy or glaucoma procedures. Timing of surgery is very important. A uh, quiescent period of three months should be necessary for uh, getting good visual prognosis as well as uh, less risk of inflammation and less risk of cystoid macular edema. If you do cataract uh, surgery in active uveitis only in two conditions where um, that is phaco antigenic uveitis and urgent VR surgery is needed. The success of cataract surgery is depending on uh, depends on the meticulous control of inflammation preoperatively and control of systemic disease. The infectious uveitis like uh, in tuberculosis, syphilis, etc., etc., should be treated preoperatively and in antiviral drugs should be given in herpetic uveitis. Uh, preoperative pre inflammation can be controlled by steroids, uh, biological agents, steroid space sparing immunosuppressive agents. The steroids should be start, uh, started considering the patient's uh, health status and comorbidities. Postoperative tapering should be based on the individualized uh, response of the patient and based on the degree of inflammation. Steroids most common protocol either oral prednisolone 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilogram per uh, day two weeks prior to surgery with slow tapering with augmented topical steroids uh, two days prior to surgery or can be oral uh, prednisolone 1 milligram per kilogram three days preoperatively. Alternative is uh, IV mede prednisolone, intravitreal triamcinolone, in, intravitreal dexa um, implants etc. can be used. Other steroids uh, dosage are either intravitreal intracameral or subtenone triamcinolone. Uh, intravitreal dexamethasone, subconjunctive dexamethasone or oral prednisolone. Steroids are mandatory in only few conditions where uh, that is JAA, BKH, uh, sympathetic ophthalmitis, pan uveitis, HLA-B27, anterior uveitis, intermediate uveitis, ag aggressive or recurrent. 
anesthesia is uh, based on the uh, based on multiple factors on sur one surgeon's preference facilities available in the center presence of structural abnormalities most of the cases either peribulbar walk or retrobulbar walk is ideal because most of the patient need iris manipulation so topical anesthesia should be avoided uh, phaco emulsification is the ideal surgery clear cornea phaco with intraocular lens implantation this is a standard of care advantage is smaller incision less manipulation of iris and less postoperative inflammation and superior ac stability ECC can be a safer surgery in patients with uh, structural abnormalities like corneal opacity, low endothelial cell count, uh, with a denser cataract and severe sonolopathy. Comparable visual outcome for both FACO and SACS by Bhargava et al. Uh, with uh, considering the uh, visual prognosis and uh, endothelial cell count. Pupils, one third of the patients, uh, UVT patients will have a small pupil. So, that represents a uh, difficult surgical technique, higher rate of addition in intraoperative maneuvers. Um, meiosis can be managed by either managed by either mechanical stretching, viscomidriasis. Here you can see uh, mechanical stretching followed by viscomidriasis, finally uh, doing sphincterotomy and even flexible iris retractors can be used. Sphincterotomy is, this is sphincterotomy. So, even though the pupil becomes irregular, but your surgery becomes more, more easier. This is iris hooks place you should not stretch the pupil too much so that, so that it can cause uh, uh, irre irreversible damage to the sphincters So, posterior sinecure can be uh, can break with uh, viscoelastic or cyclodialysis spatula, or you can use a 27 gauge cannula sweep under the uh, iris, and additionally intracamera preservative free silocaine with adrenaline. Even peripheral idectomy can be occasionally used if sinecure cannot be broken, and then finally you can um, introduce another instrument under that and uh, separate the sinecure. So, capsular excess is uh, continuous curvilinear capsular excess is the preferred one, uh, sufficiently large enough to cover the uh, optic of the eye oil. So, the, the ideal one is more than 5 millimeters size. Uh, so, so, that uh, prevents sinicia formation and uh, even uh, 5 millimeter uh, reduces anterior capsular phimosis also. So, met meticulous cortica cleanup is very important to avoid potentially pro-inflammatory material. IOL should be placed in the back, that is the preferred uh, practice by the UV uh, specialist. Minimizes the contact of the lens with the iris and ciliary body and this reduces inflammation. So, biometry is uh, most of the uh, time it, is, it will be a challenge uh, because of the al um, altered uh, catometry reading altered uh, AC depth and axial length because of band catapathy, posterior sinecure, hypotonia, cyst and macular edema. Contraindication for uh, placing IOL uh, in high risk UVATs only that is active UVATs despite maximum medication, rubiosis, hypotony, indeterminate cause of the inflammation, uh, previous IOL related complications. So, selection of IOL is superior visual acuity of uh, in IOL recipients by a meta analysis by meta et al. Previously, it was most of the patients where um, IOL was deferred, and this study showed uh, IOL uh, will be more advantageous for patients with UVHS. Acrylic hydrophobic heparin surface modified PMMA lenses are the uh, more suitable ones. Multifocal IOL should, no, should not be placed because of concurrent retinal disease and later glaucoma. IOL trial, a large multinational prospective study uh, on based on uh, different 
uh, IOLs. Post-operative outcome with these hydrophobic lenses, silicon oil PMMA lenses showed all groups have an improved vision, but acrylic lenses have least post-operative inflammation. Silicon group has highest inflammation and increased rate of PCO. So this is 2040 vision or better uh, post-operative vision and posterior capsular opacification according to the type of lens. Acrylic is, uh, PMMA followed by acrylic is uh, uh, better in vision. The post-operative management, periocular or intravitreal cortical steroids, post-operative immunomodulation should be continued. Use of topical cortical steroids slowly taper depending on the in, uh, in, uh, inflammation. Then uh, already started uh, systemic steroids should be tapered based on the inflammation and frequent reviews and monitor for cystoid macular edema. So conclusion, surgery in uh, cataract, cataract surgery in UVAT patients is complex. Stay calm and expect the unexpected. Wait for a period of documented questions of three months. Give perioperative steroids. Don't use topical anesthesia alone. Prepare for intraoperative complications. Place a three-piece three monofocal eye oil. Remember, the end of the surgery is not the end of the story. Careful monitoring is important as complications can be unpredictable and occur later than expected. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, for that wonderful talk. Now, we invite Dr. Adarsh, uh, who is uh, Assistant Professor in Medicine from Government Medical College, Kodikod. He has done his uh, post-graduation and uh, super specialization in clinical immun immunology and uh, rheumatology from PGI Chandigarh. And he'll be talking to us about systemic medications beyond steroids. Uh, a very good evening to all. At the outset, I will thank the organizers and Prasanna ma'am for giving me such an opportunity to talk. And I'll be talking on uh, going beyond steroids in uh, non-infectious UVITs. So this is the layout for my presentation. I'll be brief on the need for going beyond steroids in NIU, the treatment options available, how to select an appropriate one, and once the target is achieved, how to taper off the immunosuppressants, and few special considerations like perioperative care and pregnancy during the use of immunosuppressant drugs. So, why do we need uh, to go beyond steroids in uh, non-infectious UVITs? The answer is, I is an immune privilege side, so it will try to ward off any immune cells with so many other mechanisms. So if there is any fire, the any inflammatory fire, you have to douse it. If the fire is too much, then you may have to use something beyond or something bigger than this mold, the CO2 cylinders we use, we may have to go for the fire hydrant. So, and when you look at the etiology of non-infectious UITs, you can find a systemic illness behind many of the non-infectious UITs cases. And each flare, each inflammatory flare adds more to the cumulative cumulative uh, um, damage to the eye. So prevention of each flare is very important to prevent cumulative damage to the eye. And we know there are, although uh, steroids are wonder drugs, they have significant systemic and local adverse effects. And we have to uh, reduce these uh, side effects of corticosteroids. And already many trials like FAST or visual trials or psychomotor uh, trials have shown that when we add immunosuppressants to steroids, there is a good efficacy in uh, achieving remission to prevention of flares and complications associated with it. So we need to look for uh, adding immunosuppressants to steroids. So when should we add an uh, additional immunosuppression to steroids? When you have persistent inflammation or when you have a severe inflammation that impairs the visual function, when you have a bilateral disease, vitreous haze, when you have posterior segment uh, involvement when you have macular or optic nerve disease, significant retinal vascular inflammation. And there are conditions when you can't use steroids to higher doses, like when you have an uncontrolled, uncontrolled diabetes or when con an uncontrolled hypertension and you have other complications of steroids setting in, you may have to add uh, immunosuppressants. So this is the recent uh, fringe recommendations for management of non-infectious UVITs. So they recommend that when you have a short-term visual threat, 
as in a severe Bechet disease or when you have severe retinal vasculitis, you go for upfront anti-TNF inhibitors. So there are conditions when you have a cortico resistance, you have to use more steroids more than 0.5 mg per kg to achieve, rem uh, in, uh, to achieve remission, then you have to go for add uh, an immunosuppression drug. Or when you have cortico cor corticosteroid dependency as in when you have, when you require more than 7.5 milligrams per day of steroid to uh, achieve, uh, to maintain a remission, then you have to add immunosuppressive drugs to it. Also, this is the inclusion criteria from the FAST trial. They have used upfront uh, steroid sparing agents when uh, in conditions like Bechet disease with a significant posterior segment involvement or when you have a severe VKH or sympathetic ophthalmia. We can also uh, use this criteria in our clinical practice on adding uh, steroid sparing agents. So how do we target? We can target B cell directly with rituximab or we can direct uh, T cells, the immune cells or we can direct the uh, cytokines like TNF alpha predominantly or we can even target IL-6 and IL-1 uh, in uh, considering the immunosuppressive drug. So conventional synthetic disease modifying agents are the cornerstone and they are the time tested and trusted uh, molecules for uh, steroid sparing agents. They are anti metabolites so that include methotrexate, mycophenolate, morphotil, and azathioprine. There are calcineurin inhibitors like cyclosporin and tacrolimus, also alkylating agents like cyclophosphamide. And methotrexate is the most preferred one, most trusted one, and have a long track, uh, uh, long follow up also. So you can start from uh, 10 to 15 milligram per week, you can go up to 25 milligram per week, the maximum. And almost all the uh, uh, all the conventional synthetic disease modifying agents needs a pre workup, which includes a CBC, an RFT, LFT, and screening for hepatitis B and hepatitis C, and a chest X-ray. And once we achieve a stable immunosuppressive dose, the uh, monitoring is maybe required only three monthly or four, three to four monthly, with CBC, creatinine, and an SGP, SGPT. But when you add a new drug or when you hike an immunosuppressant, you may have to do a CBC, SGPT and creatinine one month, four weeks later. So this needs to be considered. The, uh, the preferred biological drug for uh, uveitis is TNF inhibitors. We have infliximab, adalimumab, golimumab and sertolizumab. The adalimumab is the FDA approved drug and uh, there are enough meta-analysis, there are no head-on trials, but there are enough meta-analysis that says adalimumab is better than the rest of the TNF inhibitors. So we have to give a loading dose of 80 mg subcutaneously followed by 40 mg every two weekly. You don't have to admit the patient, you can give it in an OPD basis. The pre-workup is almost same as that of the uh, conventional synthetic dermats. The only thing is that you have to screen for latent TB with a MAN2 or an interferon gamma release assay. And the monitoring is not as stringent as in the conventional synthetic dermats and you can once, uh, you can have a 3 to 6 monthly but preferably 3 monthly follow up with the CBC and an SGPT and a uh, creatinine and albumin. There are few non-TNFI uh, biological drugs available like uh, IL-6 antagonist uh, tocilizumab targeting CD20 like rituximab and there are only case series or case reports we don't have any 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 clear cut evidence on their uh, effective, effectiveness and the, mu the new molecule is Janus kinase inhibitor which is tofacitinib. Uh, the thing is that it is not a biological drug, it is one ten cheaper than the biological drug and they are as, as good as uh, biologicals in many of the rheumatological conditions like spondyl arthritis or psoriatic arthritis. So uh, there are enough case reports and case series coming up with the use of tofacitinib in uh, many of the uveitis syndromes. So, intravitreal immunosuppression with adalimumab, methotrexate and sirolimus, there are trials and they have shown to be effective. The problem is you need to have expertise and also you have the a risk of flyers are more with the intravitreal uh, injections when compared to the systemic immunosuppressant drugs. So, how to select an appropriate option? The thing is that it is based on disease characteristics. If the, um, uh, if the systemic disease, like if the systemic disease is in uh, spondyloarthritis arthritis or if the systemic disease is sarcoidosis, it depends on the, the systemic disease and the extent of uh, involvement in non-ocular involvement in the disease. And uh, you have the severity of the inflammation, how, how bad is the visual acuity which is, in, uh, which is affected and patient characteristics like uh, presence of chronic knee disease, diabetes, mellitus, liver disease, and the cost of the drug, insurance, availability, these are all uh, uh, need to be considered while selecting an appropriate option. 
the first line is always anti metabolite methotrexate mycophenolate mefetil or azathioprine they are equally effective or a calcineurin antagonist like cyclosporin or tacrolimus uh, the french guidelines 2023 says that the primary treatment for chronic or recurrent idiopathic or hla b27 related uveitis without a rheumatological manifestations is methotrexate in adults and uh, in the uh, fast trial subgroup analysis they have shown that in posterior uveitis and pan uveitis methotrexate work better than mmf and few conditions like uh, severe uveitis in bache or in jia you may have to use tnf inhibitor that is adalimumab up front two molecules etanercept which is a tnf receptor antagonist and secukinumab which is an il17 antagonist these are not recommended to be used in uveitis and they have shown to have some deleterious effects in i if the first line fails look for non adherents infections and muscular syndromes like lymphomas and if there is a vision threatening high the steroids you can even use uh, pulse glucocorticoids and you can switch the uh, conventional synthetic dermat methotrexate to mycophenolate mefetil or, uh, or calcineurin inhibitor you can add on a drug uh, you can uh, match you can combine an uh, anti metabolite with a uh, calcineurin inhibitor you can combine a tnf inhibitor with an anti metabolite and even short term if in uh, in bache disease even a short term treatment with infliximab two or three infusions along with azathioprine and maintain with azathioprine is uh, shown to have a good uh, able to help in achieving remissions especially when you don't have financial enough finances to continue with the tnf infusion so this can also be tried in our clinical practice the problem with immunosuppression is adverse effects most common is infections and uh, for tnf i demyelinating disease and heart failure needs to be considered and for calcineurin inhibitors and anti metabolites and bone marrow suppression these are the things we regularly monitor so we can pick up the adverse events very early when to taper the target is to achieve prednisolone less than 7.5 mg in sustained control and when the remission is achieved for at least 2 years we can consider starting tapering of the steroids Uh, or immunosuppressants first you taper of the steroids and then you taper of the immunosuppressive drug it should be done slowly and maybe you, if you are on 5 mg vicolon uh, prednisolone od you can taper it to 5 to 2.5 alternate day for one month and then 2.5 od for one month and alternate day 2.5 for next one month and then taper off and stop and maybe 2.5 or 5 mg per week reduction of methotrexate should be sufficient enough and monitor closely for any relapse in the uveitis few trials in pipeline the most uh, important is advice this adalimumab against uh, methotrexate bar mmf so looking hopeful for that few specific scenarios the one is vaccination you have to avoid live attenuated vaccination you have to give influenza and pneumococcal immunization to all preferably before st- at least to two weeks b- prior to starting of the immunosuppressive drugs the one important thing is perioperative care whether it is an ocular surgery or the systemic surgery the uh, disease should be in coiesent state and you have to weigh the uh, stopping immunosuppressants against the chance of flare if you have an uh, retinal vasculitis and uh, the chance of flare one flare itself can have very uh, difficult times ahead so you may have to continue with the immunosuppression and uh, go ahead with the surgery conventional synthetic disease modifying agents can, should be continued perioperatively and for biologicals you have to stop it for one uh, dosing interval for infliximab uh, for uh, adalimumab it is 2 weeks so you stop it for 2 weeks and do the surgery and once the uh, once it, there is a good wound healing you just continue with the adalimumab pregnancy drugs that we can use are azathioprine cyclosporine and sulfazalazine and tnf inhibitors and if the patient comes with a serious infection stop all the drugs except glucocorticoids glucocorticoids should be continued throughout anything so it should not be stopped abruptly if the patient has hepatitis b or hepatitis c you treat the hepatitis b and c and you can start the immunosuppressive therapy the patient has active tuberculosis treat the tuberculosis with att and at least 3 months of treatment you can consider giving immunosuppressive therapy for them and if the patient has uh, latent tb with the mantu positivity or igra positivity you have to treat the uh, treat it with uh, ltbi treatment at least one month into the therapy you can start immunosuppressant drugs so the take home points is there is a multidisciplinary approach is needed because uh, there can be a systemic cause for the non infectious uveitis and 
the drugs and the adverse effects uh, may need a multidisciplinary approach. A precise description of uh, non-infectious uveitis using a sun criteria is very helpful because most of the non-ophthalmologists uh, will be uh, will be less aware of the uh, the investigations in uh, they will won't be able to um, read the investigations in uh, ophthalmology. So, if a clear they will be treating what uh, the ophthalmologist says in chronic granulomatous uh, anterior uveitis they will just treat the chronic anterior granulomatous anterior uveitis and they will be looking only for the uh, the things that are associated with that they will not be cross checking anything anything that so if we get an uh, diagnosis of okay this is pan uveitis and these are the kind of things then we will be it will be very easy for us to uh, look for what what may be the best uh, immunosuppressant treatment that we can offer so consider steroid sparing agents in non infectious uveitis first diagnosis uh, or all follow ups so that we can at least avoid some of the FACOs or some of the MIGS uh, with this uh, better inflammation control and better steroid sparing activity. Methotrexate seems to be the best initial option in most uh, non-infectious UATs and Adalimova is the uh, initial choice of the biological drug in NIU. Monitor treatment response but look for uh, drug adverse effects too. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arthur. It was a very wonderful talk because uh, most of the facts are known more to, more to the medicine people than us ophthalmologists. Thank you, Dr.